Uh, for more on this, uh, we can cross to uh, London. Domitilia Sagromoso is a senior lecturer in security uh, development at the Department of War Studies at King's uh, College London. Thank you for joining us here on France 24. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let, let's begin with uh, listening to the uh, uh, now fourth time uh, Prime Minister of Slovakia. You heard our, our Europe editor Armin Georgian uh, referring to what Robert Fitzo said earlier in the day in Bratislava. Let's listen. I have a problem with sanctions. I guess that doesn't surprise you. At the same time, I assure you that I will support all initiatives of the European Union for peace negotiations and security guarantees. My government's position will be that an immediate ceasefire is the best solution we have for Ukraine today. Now, Slovakia, a neighbor of Ukraine, uh, how much of a problem is this uh, for Kyiv? Uh, it is. I think it is more on the symbolic and political uh, dimension that this is important uh, for Ukraine, and it becomes problematic because now we have two countries uh, besides uh, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, which are reluctant to provide military aid and insist on a peaceful uh, resolution through negotiations and through a ceasefire. I think on the military point of view, I think that is not so relevant. I mean, it is important to note that Slovakia was an important uh, sort of contributor in the sense that it provided, uh, you know, uh, weaponry to Ukraine in the past, including uh, air support with, uh, with its own airplanes, its MiG uh, air aircraft. Mm. So it was relevant. But I think that at this point, what is more important is the aid that is coming from other European players, such as Germany, France, Italy, the United Kingdom, and of course, the United States. So in terms of, of the military impact, it's not going to be very significant. Also, it's important to remember that most of the transfer of equipment to uh, Ukraine doesn't go through Slovakia, but primarily to Poland, potentially also to Romania. But, uh, you know, it's not going to affect the outcome of the, of the war uh, effectively. It just has a very important sort of symbolic and political impact. Yeah, in the last hour, uh, we've had another one of those announcements you're referring to. This one coming out of Washington, $150 million assistance uh, for Kyiv that includes additional munitions for national advanced surface-to-air missile systems and anti-aircraft missiles. We get these announcements regularly, Domitia Sagramoso, but uh, on the ground, uh, we're not seeing the big breakthrough that uh, everyone had hoped on the uh, Ukrainian side uh, since the spring? Yes, I think there was a lot of uh, expectations that the Ukrainians would do really well very quickly. And uh, and that became also problematic because it raised sort of the stakes. Mm. And uh, what happened was that there was sort of regular taking of the temperature of what was happening on the front line to determine whether Ukraine was going to succeed or not. Uh, what is clear is that the Russians set up very effective defensive lines from uh, the areas around the Dnipro on the, on the west, all the way to the Donbass through Zaporizhia and in the areas of Kherson. And that is making it very difficult for the Ukrainians to advance because, uh, you know, because of the minefields, because of the whole system of protection and tunnels and, and artillery, that, that the barrages that come over uh, when there are advances. And also because uh, the battlefield has now become a lot more transparent through drones and through many other sort of more modern technologies, it's now much easier to hit uh, at moving targets. So any kind of offensive faces a lot of challenges. And this also applies to the Russians. They are currently trying to advance in, in the town of Adivka in the Donbass, and they also faced a very, very significant number of casualties. Uh, very high numbers. There's talk that they lost, I think, over 1,500 men in one day. Uh, so I think that this is a challenge that both sides are facing. Now, of course, the situation in a way favors the Russians because they are the ones that are defending the territory that they have already occupied and the Ukrainians have to dislodge them. Uh, also, the Russians have the advantage that they have um, much more resources in terms of men and equipment. They have put their industry sort of in a war footing, so the arms production is taking pace, whereas in the case of Ukraine, Ukraine has still to rely on supplies from its Western allies, and uh, that is going to take time. Uh, industrial production in Ukraine is also uh, a challenge. Uh, 
So I think we are only thinking about maybe another year for Ukraine to be in a very strong position to again carry out uh, an effective counteroffensive. It also lost a significant number of men. We do not know the exact figures, but there are there are serious challenges on the front line. Uh, Russia is also getting a lot of uh, artillery and uh, ammunition from uh, you know, ammunition from North Korea and also drones and missiles from Iran. So I think that uh, at the moment, one could argue that they are in slightly better position, but they haven't been able to uh, capitalize and make serious advances either. And if I have a moment, what I think it would, would be interesting to highlight is the situation on the Black Sea where the Ukrainians with the naval drones Wait, but, but, have been able before, to... Uh, uh, Domitia, before we get to the Black Sea, uh, let's unpack first what you've just said. First of all, Advika, there we have the Russians on the offensive. Uh, what does that tell you? Because all we have to rely on here are the communiques put out uh, by the military brass. Yes, I mean, it seems uh, from reporting also from uh, French newspapers, Le Monde, for example, talking about the challenges uh, around Adivka, uh, because uh, they, the Russians have thrown a massive amount of men and equipment. They have not been really worried about the number of casualties. So I think we might be facing similar encirclement as happened with Bakhmut, where it is, becomes harder for Ukrainians to provide supplies to the city. Adivka is very interesting because this is a city that has been on the front lines since 2014, and the Ukrainians have very, very hard tried to, to occupy the upper hills so as to protect the city better. So it's been really one of those cities that have been quite symbolic also for Ukrainians. Uh, they've managed to keep it always under their control, and I think they're going to keep fighting to make sure it doesn't really fall. But I, I'm, I'm afraid that we might found a, find ourselves in a similar situation as in Bakhmut, where this becomes a sort of almost a road-to-road, -road, building to building fight, uh, which in that sense sometimes benefits the Russians because they, at this moment, do not face uh, the serious challenges that maybe Ukraine does in terms of equipment and also in terms of manpower. Not because, uh, you know, not only they have more manpower, but Putin is in a better position to force uh, individuals to the front line. To, to go to the front line. And just on, on the, you, you mentioned the Black Sea. We had earlier this week uh, uh, the Ukrainian president saying effectively that Crimea will soon be back uh, in Kyiv's hands. Uh, what, could we see a situation where the Russians gain ground in the east and lose Crimea? Is that possible? I mean, it is a possibility, but it's very difficult uh, right now to imagine that the Ukrainians, without a proper amphibious force, would be able to take over Crimea. And what they can do, is to, they, which is what they're doing, is to weaken uh, the naval presence of Russia in Crimea and also hit at the supply lines, potentially at, uh, for example, the Crimean Bridge and other lines of communication and support to Crimea. And uh, in that respect, because they've challenged the Black Sea Fleet, which has its main base on the at Sevastopol, they're forcing many of the vessels of the Black Sea Fleet to move further to the east, to the port of Novorossiysk. And there's also now talk in Russia that they might use a port in Abkhazia, which is legally part of, uh, of Georgia, but is under Abkhaz control and Russian sort of protection, uh, so that this port of Ochamchire in Abkhazia might also become uh, a point for the Black Sea Fleet. So that shows that, uh, you know, in that, in that respect, you know, the balance of power on the western fringes of the Black Sea has changed over the last months or so, and the Ukrainians are being able to export through the Black Sea, so that is quite significant. And another minor point, or not minor, but important point, if I may, uh, if I may add, is that I think that we're going to see increasing opposition inside Russia to uh, carry the number of casualties. We're starting to see mothers of soldiers getting organized. We're starting to see victims' families becoming organized, something we didn't see at the start. So I think we need to be cautious uh, when we think about a complete stalemate or a victory on the side, uh, you know, that the momentum is on the side of Russia. Domitia uh, Sagramoso, many thanks for joining us from London.